This webinar is being provided to new speech-language pathologists or new speech-language pathology assistants who are working in the schools. Participant goals for this webinar, including awareness of reasons documentation is important, understanding the necessity for documentation, understanding specific documentation requirements of Medicaid, understanding the confidentiality of documentation mandated by IDEA, HIPAA, and FERPA, sharing ideas about organizational systems for documentation, and sharing teachers pay teachers vendors who have documentation systems. We all know that making time for documentation can become a juggling act sometimes. With so many things you're trying to do, it's, it's difficult to make sure you get that documentation completely written down, that it's logged or you know where to find it, and um, getting documentation during group sessions or sessions within the classroom can be difficult at times, but um, it can be done, and hopefully this presentation will help you figure out ways to do that. We all know that we do not live in a perfect world. It would be wonderful if we did, but the reality is we're not only facing issues that we typically face when we um, work in the school system, but we're also dealing with a pandemic. So some of our challenges might include time, different changes and updates, um, you've already experienced some of the changes that happen as the met metrics change and um, school systems are given different um, alerts as far as whether they can be in person or um, virtual or remote. So in vari variations of expectations by the state, county, and school can make it difficult, but you guys can handle it. Um, thankfully, um, speech language pathologists and, and assistants are typically type A personalities. And so having a management system to manage your documentation makes everything so much easier. Documentation in the school system has one consistent theme, and that is if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. Or if you didn't document it, you didn't do it. I've seen that happen time and time again um, in cases that I've been called in um, to consult on uh, with the Office of Federal Programs when they've received either state complaints or due process um, documents, um, uh, due process requests. Um, the, the therapist may say, or the IEP team may say, we told the parents all these things we're gonna offer and um, you know, we promised all these different things, but if it wasn't written in the prior written notice, or if you have document uh, documentation requested for a due process or a state complaint, and you don't have written down and documented everything that you did with that student, then it didn't happen. You, they will not take your word for it. They will not take um, the fact that you said you did it. You have to have documentation to prove it. The definition of documentation is that it's material that provides official information or evidence that serves as a record. ASHA says that documentation is a critical vehicle for communicating amongst clinicians and other stakeholders in a student's education and well-being. And other stakeholders may be the parents, it may be other members of the IEP team, classroom teacher, all of those people could be involved. Documentation does provide clinical information for diagnosis, treatment, and outcomes. Documentation efficiently answers questions that therapists, administrators, and parents may ask. Strong documentation is critical for making good decisions. So in order to know how to move your student through their IEP goals, it's very important that you have documentation to show how they're doing and that your data drives the decisions that you make regarding that student's progress and the goals that, they, that they're addressing. Documentation answering questions from parents and administrators um, is very important because you may have a principal who wants to see your, your daily logs um, once a month or you know every other week, just like they do classroom teachers lesson plans. If that's the um, demand in your school, typically you're expected to um, adhere to that. And if that's the case, then having your documentation in order 
also lets the, the principal know that you are doing your job and doing it well. Documentation containing unclear or vague or missing information can often preclude noncompliance with the IEP, ethical charges, and the inability to defend decisions in a due process situation. Strong documentation defines a clinical judgment regarding diagnosis and treatment. The one thing I want to say right now is that I am definitely not trying to scare you by mentioning due process or state complaints or that kind of thing. But I do want you to be aware that if something should happen and you should be involved in a situation like that, if you have strong documentation, you will be fine. If you do not have documentation that you can produce within the time range that they give you, then you will not be in a good position to defend yourself or the services that you provided for your student. In my 34 years of working in Kanawha County, I was only involved in two state complaints and one due process that didn't that ended in um, mediation. We didn't go to court. Um, and in all cases, I produced the documentation to prove that services had been provided. So, you know, there weren't any repercussions after that. Um, but just be, just knowing that and knowing that because I had the documentation, I was I was prepared and backed by the county. I want you to be in that position as well. So not trying to scare you, just letting you know that, you know, documentation is extremely important. It's documentation also serves as a communication tool shared among the team serving the student. The clinical record is an overall indicator of clinical and service quality and serves as a basis for planning for the service con continuity. Documentation is among the most basic of our professional and ethical responsibilities because ASHA also requires us to have um, documentation, to keep documentation and use data. And it's both an a privilege and an obligation to be able to collect that data and, and provide that documentation. We must demonstrate our added value to our, our county by having the documentation that we need. I honestly can say that I've had um, special education directors contact me at the end of the school year and say that we found out we had a therapist who was not keeping documentation the entire year. Um, she hadn't got Medicaid, gotten Medicaid signatures, she hadn't documented her, her daily therapy, and um, there were some IEPs that had that documentation hadn't been kept on it. So in those cases, they always say, what can we do? What can we do? Well, there's nothing you can do at that point. You can't go back and recreate, you can't go back and backdate documentation, and you can't create data. So just rem remember, the reason we're saying this and really pushing the importance of this is because it has happened. It happens more often than you might think. And so just remember, it, it is our responsibility. The purpose of documentation was, was delineated in 2004 in, a, in an article. And some of the reasons um, that strong documentation is required include justification for services, including initiation, continuation, and dismissal. Um, it supports diagnosis and treatment. It helps with progress reporting. It describes the student's progress. It defines the student's response to the intervention you provided. And it provides support for reimbursement or denials um, through Medicaid if you're billing. Um, it helps with the development of the present level of academic and functional performance, or the PLAF, on the IEP, and it, it's communication with other service providers. It also is used for consultative therapy services and justifies that those have been happening and what the results of those have been. It facilitates quality improvement. It documents communication among service providers and parents. It protects the legal interest of the student, the service provider, and the school. It provides data for research and continuing education and serves as evidence in state complaints or due processes. 
documentation is our responsibility and you can't escape that responsibility um, of tomorrow by evading it today because honestly if you don't do your documentation daily and keep up with it you can get behind really quickly some of the information that requires documentation now you're going to have like IEP forms you're going to have PWNs and those kinds of things, but, and so that documentation is going to happen because you have a, fo a form to put it on, like your screening results and all those kinds of things. But there are other, there's other information and other uh, job responsibilities that you have and things that you do that you need to um, document as well. Some of those include your evaluation and assessments your daily progress notes and you'll find that we use progress notes and daily therapy logs interchangeably um, the progress notes are different than progress reports which just come out every nine weeks every a report card reporting period so those two terms are used interchangeably um, you have to document your time in therapy with the, with each student and I mean the start and finish um, time um, you have to report the number of sessions, proof of the session. Um, you have to do Medicaid billing if you um, have your West Virginia Board of Examiners licensure. And if you don't, you'll still be required to do Medicaid billing for the cost settlement. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. Um, you should document all phone calls that you make and phone calls that you receive because I can tell you from personal experience, this, uh, from working in the schools and definitely from working in this job, if I didn't keep a call log of all the conversations I had and the topics that we discussed, there would be times that I would really um, be in a bind. But thankfully I have, and it helps so much when you have a uh, special ed director or a parent call and say, I talked to you a month ago and this is what you said and now I need to do this. So I can go back through those logs and, and, and see what's happened. Um, teacher contacts. Anytime you contact with, you make um, contact with the teacher and discuss the student um, or if you have collaboration that needs to be documented. Um, parent contacts, IEP team contacts. If you talk with the o OT of a student, you're also serving with speech services. That needs to be documented. And information sent home to parents. If you're sending homework packets and that kind of thing, jot down documentation that you've done that. It helps protect you and um, it helps, you know, you keep track of what you sent home for the student so you don't keep sending the same information home. Components of documentation can include two types of data. Qualitative, which is not really a measure um, per se, like with numbers and that kind of thing, but it's just more a, of a description of, of what happened in the session. It's not a numeral form, but it's data that approximates or character, characterizes, but does not measure. Quantitative data is going to be your accuracy levels, those kinds of things. It's expressing a quantity, an amount, or a range. So it could be 8 out of 10 productions or, or 8 out of 10 activations on a, a communication device. Quantitative data um, defines data that can be expressed as a number. Scores on a test, numbers of hours, how many, how much, how often, all those kinds of things. Documentation for Medicaid. Um, we found out several years ago that um, Medicaid did have specific documentation that they wanted in included in the daily progress notes. And so um, we decided to contact them and make sure that the, the uh, progress note logs that we were using um, adequately provided the information. And so we sent um, seven, I think it was seven, um, templates. We collected them from different counties and I created a couple and um, sent them to um, BMS to have them um, evaluated. And um, I'll, sh I'll talk about that information in just a second. But I do want you to know that a sample template um, for Medicaid billing is under um, files in your Teams group and it's in the documentation folder. There's also an example of how to complete that form. Um, talk with your, your either your county um, lead speech language pathologist or your special education director if you don't have a lead to make sure which format they want you to use for your soap notes if they I mean for your notes if they don't have a format then 
you know, you might want to consider using the template that's in your folder, um, documentation folder. The requirements for Medicaid um, says that documentation must contain the following and it has to be completed within 30 calendar days from the date of service. Um, so it means you have to sign off on that report and have that information in your progress note within 30 days of service. Documentation must indicate how often this service is to be provided. There must be a progress note describing each service provided, the relationship of the service to to the identified speech therapy needs and the member's response to service. The progress note must include the reason for service, symptoms and functioning of the member, a therapeutic intervention grounded in a specific and identifiable theoretical base that provides framework for assessing, assessing change, and the member's, member's response, and when we're talking about members, they're talking about the Medicaid um, member, which will be the student. Um, the student's response to the intervention and or the treatment. So um, as we started working with them, we realized that um, this was more detailed than we had been providing in our other formats because a lot of times we just had checklists and that kind of thing, which were, were great because you could check off what sound they were working on and put your, you know, your data in there, but they wanted something different. And it's because they're, it's basically a medical, um, service um, that you're providing and so that's the reason they want the different information. One thing that I do want you to know and I forgot to mention too with Medicaid we will have a webinar for you with our Medicaid program specialist Kelly Johnson. Um, we'll have a webinar for you on Medicaid itself but in the meantime I did want you to know about some of the Medicaid documentation because that's going to be included in your logbook and um, you need to have the a copy um, of the member service plan, and so that means the student service plan, plan of service for Medicaid, um, signatures and credentials for each session note, and place of service and date of service. So I contacted um, Cynthia Parsons, who's a program manager at the um, Bureau for Medical Services, and sent her those seven formats. Um, she, they were for four different counties, and she only approved one. And she made several comments, and these comments are important. So I want you to make sure and pay attention to these. Be careful with check boxes or fill in boxes. Um, so they, you know, they want it to be more, um, more space so that you can write more information for them. The um, auditors are not fond of them and they scrutinize them more. Um, that was one of the notes that she wrote. Um, the auditors also need to be able to understand your, your coding or whatever you use to report your information. I used to put things on mine like I, um, IMF production, I mean like IMF R, um, you know, with uh, written in phonetics, 90%, um, something like that. IMF, they have no idea what that means. You know, to me, it was simple, initial, medial, final, but they do not know. So just make sure that you write your notes so that an auditor or someone who knows nothing about speech can, can understand and discern what's happening. Um, she, the forms that we sent her, she said, I don't think those are truly a soap note. While you have all the areas listed, it's not truly all the information they wanted. And they do expect an example like um, Leanne completed the goal with 85% accuracy or was able to say word eight out of 10 times. Um, at first they wanted complete sentences. Um, we did get that changed, but they want pretty much a soap note and we know that nobody has time to do that. So this is the form that they approved and we've sent it out to counties. They are, um, you know, you're able to use it. It's not a mandatory form. It's not a Department of Ed form, but it is a template um, for you to use um, if you're trying to make sure you have all the information you need for Medicaid building, billing. There are drop down boxes with it and um, that kind of thing. You can list your goals at the top and then um, you can list your goal numbers. Um, if you see them down in the um, where it says date, type of contact, um, goal numbers, you can just list the goal number there and then put your response um, there. <clears throat> so you don't have to write the whole goal out again once you've listed them at the top. 
Um, like I said, this is just a format, um, a, a suggested format, but not anything mandatory. And you'll find out very soon um, through all my examples that I'm a huge Bon Jovi fan. <laughs> um, the Medicaid manual itself um, is online um, at the Department of Ed if you look under Medicaid, but I've also uploaded it for you um, in your Teams group under Files and it's in the Medicaid folder. I would ask that you look at the, at the information beginning on page 18 of the manual and become familiar with that because that's going to help you when you when you do Medicaid billing. Um, the SOAP note format, um, I included the information here on the PowerPoint for those of you who may not be actually new, fresh out of school therapist, but maybe therapists who've been perhaps working in a um, nursing home or a SNF and you're coming to the school system for the first time. So there is information here on SOAP notes and what they mean, um, but um, we're not going to go through all that because you've obviously learned it in school if you're just out and if you've been working in a SNF or someplace else then you know what a SOAP note is. Um, so we're going to go on through this information and here again, any progress notes should be clear enough for any reviewer who has speech knowledge or not to know the rationale for treatment, the nature of the treatment, the student's status, and next steps to achieving the goal. And these are just some examples of soap notes in the different areas. So when you think about documentation, there are some do's and don'ts. One of the do's is to write legibly or, or type. Um, and with the writing legibly, um, I cannot write legibly anymore. Um, I have a, a difficult time writing, so I have to type almost everything. So you can use electronic documentation. Just make sure that it's stored securely on your um, computer. And if your principal or your special ed director wants you to have um, paper co hard copies in your logbook, then you'll just have to print out those pages when they're complete. Um, be timely with your documentation. Don't get behind and think, oh, I'll catch up on it later because I'm telling you, <laughs> I know I've done that before. I had um, the first year I moved to uh, the primary school that I ended up in, I had 17 nonverbal students and I never had nonverbal students before. So it was kind of a trial by fire and I was doing everything I could to learn about AAC and that kind of thing. And I kept thinking, I'll get my documentation down later. And man, I got severely behind. So don't let that happen to you. Try to keep up with it. Make sure you leave time in your day to, to finish your documentation at the end of the day so you don't you can move on to the next day. It'll, it'll go a lot smoother for you and be less pressure. Write everything down. You know, whether or not it's something that should be documented, that's okay, but write everything down. But um, document all additional information. Like I said, the parent contacts, teacher consults, that kind of thing. And you can document that. You can have a separate log page that you document parent contacts, phone calls, all those. However you want to organize yourself and use appropriate abbreviations. Don't treat your documentation like the kitchen sink. Put everything imaginable in there because you're going to find out in just a minute why you don't want to do that. Um, don't be vague and don't plan to do your documentation later. Don't write anything in your documentation that you wouldn't mind a parent or a hearing examiner reading. Because what will happen is if someone requests your documentation, and it can be as simple as a parent requesting your documentation, um, then you have to to show you have to provide your documentation to them. Um, if that would happen to you though, contact your lead therapist or your um, county special education director to find out exactly how much you have to provide because I've had that happen before, especially students with autism. Um, their parents um, sometimes request documentation for different reasons and sometimes it could be because they're upset with the classroom, but they uh, they request your documentation as well. So, you know, if they would request your documentation, for instance, for a whole semester or for two years, just contact your special ed director or your lead therapist and find out exactly how much you need to provide for them. But if, if you would happen to go to due process, they can request your records and you have to turn in everything, everything that you've ever written down about that student. 
So if you go to team meetings, if you go to IEP meetings and you're taking notes, I used to do that, <laughs> um, but I stopped doing it as much because um, they can request everything that you have about that student. So just be judicious about how you do it and with the information that you, that you document. Keeping your documentation confidential. We're going to talk more about the confidentiality issues later, but I did want to, want to remind you that there are three acts that require that you keep information about students with disabilities or just general ed, um, students um, confidential. One is IDEA, of course. Um, the second one is FERPA, the Federal Education Record Protection Act, and that's solely for educational records. Um, so anything relating to that student, there are laws about how you can share it and that kind of thing. But for your purposes, anything that you have about that student, like identifying information, grades, work sample, anything like that, make sure you keep it um, in a safe place, preferably under lock and key. Um, it used to be that we were told that it had to be in a locked file cabinet, but um, I'm not sure about what situation you'll be in in your school base, but you may not have a locked file cabinet. If you don't, then if you can lock it up in your classroom and lock the door when you leave, um, you know, hopefully that would that would protect it enough, but don't leave it lying out on your desk or someplace where people can easily just walk in and see it. Um, same thing for HIPAA. Um, we've all heard of HIPAA because we have to sign that when we go to our personal physicians, the HIPAA um, acknowledgement. But for our students who have Medicaid, we are, you know, we do have a medical diagnosis for them and, and that kind of thing. So we have to protect that information and keep it confidential as well. So all of your records, anything um, with um, students identifying educational or um, medical information should be kept under lock and key. Um, storing your documentation. A lot of people say, how long should I keep it? Um, for your student main file, um, and that's where you're going to keep all the original copies of like the student's IEP, um, anything related to that student and their special education um, is going to be in a main file, typically in your um, building, in your school building. And um, most counties now, I think, have digital copies of all that information stored at the, at the board office. So follow the county procedure as far as how long those records need to remain after the student exits the school system. Um, your working file. You can have a soft file or a working file um, for yourself. And usually the recommendation is for about five years um, because that's about how far they will go back if there's a due process or that kind of thing. But I typically try to keep it for seven years just to be safe. <laughs> so you can, you can follow the direction of your um, lead therapist if you have one about how much they usually say to keep it. Um, other records, it depends on the type of records. If it's Medicaid records, keep those for seven years um, because if they did an audit, I think they can go back that far. Um, information can be stored in a um, secure location. Um, like I said, all the original copies of your IEP should be in the main file. Your working file is a student transfers out of your school or they move up to a different, different level. Um, and there's going to be a different receiving therapist, you can share that file with them, but always keep a copy for your records too. Because if there's, if there's a question about the service that was provided during the time that you had that student, you need to have access for those, to those records. And I know too many people that have passed their files on along to the next therapist and the next therapist just said, well, I've got my own records. I don't need to keep these and they've thrown them, thrown them away. So, you know, you can keep copies, you can scan copies and keep electronic files, however you want to do it, but make sure they're safe. If they're on a thumb drive, um, make sure that you keep that thumb drive safe um, so that it's not somewhere that someone can just pick it up and have access to all that information on a student. Probably the safest way to store it is in the cloud um, under um, a passcode so that you, you, know, you don't have to worry about someone else having access to it or finding the thumb drive. Um, other records um, like Medicaid billing, um, students who didn't qualify, screening records and those kinds of things, they should all be kept in a secure location. Um, normally when we've done this training, we've provided um, some suggestions 
to the to you guys about how to organize like your your therapy log your notebook that has all your information in it but this time since we're not meeting with you personally we decided to just share some resources with you and tell you some places to find some editable forms and that kind of thing that you can set up your own logbook um, there are tons of free materials as well as um, cheap um, paid um, teachers pay teachers um, editable um, logbook forms that you can that you can get and if you've used any of those or found some that you really like if you could share the vendor and the name of the of the documentation um, with us either um, on our call tomorrow or um, just within the group you can post it you can do a general post in the group and say something like i love um speech room news or jenna rayburn kirk um, for her the packets that she uses for her logbook just those kinds of things to give information to each other because you know and a lot of times i know i like to create my own but the older I've gotten, the, the more I like the fact that I can just go in and edit someone else's. And they might think of things I haven't. So those are great things, great resources for you to do. And if you already have an organizational system that works for you, let's say you've worked in another county and you have an organizational system and you're going to use the same system within your new county, please share those ideas with us on the chat tomorrow too, or post those in the general um, uh, comments as well in our team. Data collection options for speech therapy. This is a, a really good, um, simple to understand um, article. It's a blog about um, data collection. And so I just gave you the link for that. And it's by the Speech Bubble. I went ahead when I um, found this link and, and joined her. You know, it's a free membership. Um, and she does have some really good um, free re resources, blogs, and that kind of thing. So you might want to check her out. More documentation resources. Um, I've attended um, a couple of times. Jenna Rayburn Kirk, who does Speech Room News, um, does a speech SLP 101 for beginning therapists. She does a webinar each year, and I've, I've joined that a couple of times. And this is some information and from her blog. It's free. It's not anything that I've used um, from her um, webinar. Um, but it tells you about working folders, like your folder, how to organize those. If you want to keep individual folders for your students with their IEPs and that kind of thing, which I would recommend that you do, um, especially if you're just learning to read IEPs and that kind of thing, because that way you have access to them and you don't have to run to the office every time you need to see it, check out a goal or something like that. Um, or bring up online IEP and check it there. So um, this is just an organizational article about um, how to set up your own folder. Um, check out the information on Pinterest. I know Pinterest was a huge thing several years ago, and I honestly used to <laughs> run through my um, iPad's complete charged power in an evening every time I get on Pinterest because there were so many good things but if you just type in um, documentation um, organization or logbook organization or documentation period on Pinterest there'll be tons of articles and great suggestions for you to use same thing with teachers pay teachers I know this is a lot of information at one time, but you've got this. You've had to do documentation in college. You've had to do it if you've been working in another um, setting. Um, so you know how to do documentation. This is just to remind you about the importance of it, how it might be used um, while you're working in the school system, how it might be requested, and just try to get you off on the right foot as far as documentation is concerned. But if you have questions, please know that you can always reach out to Libby or me at any time, and you can always post questions within our Teams group. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Have a great day.